Before we begin today's episode, just a reminder to like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell if you enjoy this episode. Ninety seconds. That's how long it took for 11-year-old Mikkel Biggs to disappear from the streets of Mesa, Arizona in January of 1999. Riding her sister's bike, waiting for the arrival of the ice cream man, less than two minutes later her younger sister arrived to find the bike lying in the street. The back tire was still spinning, but Mikkel was gone. For more than 20 years, the mystery of what happened to Mikkel has haunted both her family and investigators. How does a child go missing so quickly, leaving behind no trace of who may have taken her? While many believe this was a random crime, both investigators and the family have turned their attention to a neighbor with a history of crimes targeting both children and adults. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 130, The Vanishing of Mikkel Biggs. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we examine the horrifying child abduction of 11-year-old Mikkel Biggs. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. The show is also available on MeWe and Minds. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon available at patreon.com slash traceevidence, or you can donate via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions directly through the website or email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. Today we examine the mysterious disappearance of 11-year-old Mikkel Biggs, one of the most highly requested cases of the past few months. This is episode 130, The Vanishing of Mikkel Biggs. You could hear it coming in the distance, a sound almost every child living in suburban America is familiar with. While there are variations in the exact tune, the speed, and the song chosen, it typically yields the same results. Children's eyes light up with excitement as the sound echoes through the streets, telling them only one thing. The ice cream man is coming. On Saturday, January 2nd, 1999, that familiar melody came jingling down the streets of Mesa, Arizona, urging 11-year-old Mikkel Biggs to ask her mother for a few quarters in eager anticipation of a sweet treat. As the sun began sinking towards the horizon, the cool winter winds came sweeping through. Mikkel was joined by her younger sister, nine-year-old Kimber, trailed in tow by the family dog. At the time, Mikkel was seated atop Kimber's bike, a birthday gift received earlier in the year, riding in large circle loops near the intersection of South Toltec Street and East El Moro Avenue, just a few houses away from their own home. It sounded as though the ice cream truck was off to the west, likely in the vicinity of nearby Franklin East Elementary School. For an unspecified period of time, both sisters waited as the air grew colder in the dying light of evening. It was the type of adventure thousands of children embark upon each day, be it waiting for the ice cream truck to come slowly sailing down the lane, or in some cases, chasing it a few blocks in hopes of grabbing a popsicle with a piece of gum in the center or a tricolored snow cone. While in almost every case, a visit from the ice cream man results in big grins spreading across blue or red smeared lips, on this evening, it would instead lead to a terrible mystery for a family, a case long gone cold, jarring the residents from the safety of their neighborhood whose streets are now haunted with these unanswered questions. It was quickly approaching 6 p.m. when Kimber, cold and out of patience, decided she was going to take the quick walk back home. Mikkel, though, was intent on getting some ice cream and decided to stay a little longer and wait. 
As Kimber turned to make the trip home, the streetlights began to gently buzz as they fired on, which was generally considered the girls' curfew. Night was coming, and it was time to get back home. Finally approaching the house, Kimber turned her head to look both ways before crossing the street. In the distance, she could see the shape of her older sister at the quiet intersection. It would be the last time she would ever see Mikkel, and to this day it is believed that she was the last person to see her sister, other than the person who just moments later would abduct her. Mikkel Diana Biggs was born on May 31, 1987, to parents Tracy and Darren. Mikkel was their firstborn, though they would go on to have two more daughters, Kimber and Linnell, as well as a son, Nathan. Mikkel was a smart young girl with a contagious smile and beautiful hazel eyes set beneath shoulder-length strands of dirty blonde hair, which she frequently wore parted down the center. Mikkel has been described as a creative and talented child with a propensity for musical instruments. She loved playing clarinet as well as piano, and at one point, she took piano lessons from a neighbor not very far from the very spot from which she would disappear. She was on the honor roll at nearby Lindbergh Elementary and also served on the student council. Her creativity was noted in school where she was lauded as being artistically skilled. She loved to draw and frequently utilized purple, her favorite color. While most 11-year-olds hold obscure fantasies of their futures, wanting to be a spy or an astronaut, Mikkel believed she'd already found her calling through her artistic endeavors and dreamed of becoming a Disney animator. Mikkel grew up in a tight-knit, loving family, and multiple articles have described her as very sociable. Unfortunately, Mikkel's life and all of her dreams would be forever stolen away in the blink of an eye when she vanished after being left alone for less than 90 seconds. Returning to their home that fateful Saturday night, Kimber barely had time to open the door before her mother inquired as to where Mikkel was. Since the streetlights had come on and the night was growing cold, Tracy told Kimber to go back outside and tell Mikkel it was time to come home. Kimber walked back to the sidewalk from where she'd last seen her sister's silhouette, shouting out their mother's command. There was no answer, though, and in the distance, Kimber saw no sign of movement. Frustrated, she began the short walk back, passing four houses before reaching the intersection. Much to her surprise, Mikkel was nowhere to be seen. Instead, Kimber's prized bike was lying on its side just a foot or so from the curb. Mikkel couldn't have been gone long, as Kimber recounted that the back tire was still spinning as she approached her bike. Annoyed now, thinking that her sister had ditched the bike and run off somewhere, the nine-year-old picked it up and slowly walked home. Once she put the bike away, she entered the house and explained to her mother that not only was Mikkel not there, but she had left her bike in the street. At first, Tracy wasn't tremendously concerned. There were neighbors nearby that Mikkel often played with, so it was assumed that she had simply gone off to one of their houses. Kimber was sent out once again, this time towards the Miller residence, where it was thought that Mikkel may have gone. According to the Arizona Republic, Kimber knocked on the door and found the Miller family home, having just sat down to begin their dinner. When Kimber inquired as to whether or not Mikkel had come by, she was surprised when they explained that Mikkel wasn't there, though they noted they had just seen her moments earlier riding the bike in the street. The Miller's oldest son decided to go outside with Kimber and see if they could track down her older sister. As the two walked towards the curb where Kimber had found her bike, the older boy noted something glistening in the street. As he approached, he saw the quarters Mikkel had been given earlier for ice cream were now lying very close to where the bike had been found. An eerie feeling came over Kimber, who later described it by saying, quote, It was almost like the twilight zone. I remember feeling numb not feeling anything, end quote. Looking at the quarters, the older boy turned to Kimber and solemnly explained that she needed to get home right away and tell her parents that she couldn't find her sister. At the time, several of Tracy's cousins were in town visiting while the kids were on holiday break from school, the new year having just come the day before. As Kimber walked into the room and explained to her mother that Mikkel was nowhere to be found, everything changed. According to Kimber, she remembers watching her mother's face slowly drop, her skin growing pale as the implication sunk in. Her daughter was missing. Things happened in rapid succession after that. 
The visiting cousins walked out, getting into their truck to drive through the neighborhood and nearby areas, calling out and looking for Mikkel. Tracy placed two phone calls, one to her husband explaining the situation. Darren explained that he was leaving and would be home as fast as possible. The other call, at approximately 6.15 p.m., went to the Mesa Police Department, who were rapid in their response, enlisting the assistance of the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office who would send bloodhounds to the scene. Unfortunately, police had little of a crime scene to investigate. The bike had been walked home by Kimber, and outside of the two quarters found in the street, there was nothing to suggest where Mikkel may have gone, but it seemed obvious from the start that investigators were dealing with an abduction. Yellow police tape cordoned off the intersection and area surrounding where Mikkel had last been seen as police poured over the area searching for any clues which might give them a direction to go. After speaking with Kimber, investigators narrowed down the field of time and ultimately determined that whoever had taken Mikkel had struck within the small window of 90 seconds, the amount of time it would have taken Kimber to walk to her home, come back out, and walk the short distance back to the intersection. Utilizing the bloodhounds, they were able to pick up Mikkel's scent, but the trail was short moving from the area where the bike had been found approximately three feet, stopping near the middle of the road. This indicated only one likelihood. Mikkel had been taken into a vehicle at that same spot and driven away. The initial search for Mikkel was massive. A conglomeration of police, sheriff's deputies, and local volunteers scoured the neighborhood and surrounding areas. Kimber, interviewed back in 2018 on The Vanished podcast hosted by Marissa Jones, explained that as volunteers went door-to-door, almost everyone allowed them to walk into their homes to check for Mikkel, but there were no signs detected anywhere. After knocking on each door, more volunteers would come join the search, spreading out rapidly. It was insane, to say the least. How could a little girl vanish in such a small window of time with the sun not fully set, and not a single person had seen or heard anything? As Kimber later explained to CBS News, quote, There's a reason they say Mikkel Biggs vanished into thin air, because it looks like she did. End quote. Mesa police utilized a helicopter within 30 minutes of the initial missing child report, flying low over the neighborhood and surrounding areas. Large speakers broadcast officers' voices as they announced that they were searching for a missing child. The National Missing Children's Organization became involved, assisting with both searching and the production of flyers which would bear a recent school photo of Mikkel. Thousands of flyers would be distributed in the early days by family, friends, and volunteers who simply wanted to help. The outpouring of support from the community was immense, with neighbors knocking on the Biggs' door, offering their support and condolences. Those knocks were often accompanied by a large supply of food, so much so that their refrigerator became jammed front to back with prepared meals. That first weekend saw thousands upon thousands of searchers coming into the neighborhood and surrounding areas, launching what has been touted as one of the largest searches in Arizona history. The FBI was brought in to assist in the search, while a command post was established at the very school McKell attended, Lindbergh Elementary on Lozona Drive. Police set roadblocks in the area, questioning drivers as to anything they might have seen. They received a lot of tips though almost all were dead ends. Sometimes someone reported seeing a strange person in the area, but that person either turned out to be lost or a new neighbor. Other times, vehicle descriptions were given, but when they were checked out, there was nothing tying them to that area. At one point, a witness reported seeing a copper-colored jeep in the area, leaving right around the time Mikkel is believed to have been taken. When police chased down that lead, they were able to clear the driver. Another potential lead had been eliminated. One tip led to a massive search of a factory, though nothing of interest was found. Another tip sent via email claimed to be from Mikkel's abductor. When police assembled a SWAT team and raided the home after tracing the IP address, they found the sender had been a 12-year-old boy. While many volunteers and police were searching, Other investigators were going door-to-door questioning neighbors in search of a potential suspect. They thoroughly questioned any sex offenders living in the area. There were 20 at the time, though they ultimately zeroed in on one who lived just two blocks from the Biggs' family house. 
D. Blaylock, 42 at the time, was known around town as a somewhat annoying but harmless drunk, according to the Arizona Republic. Drunk, yes, but harmless, not so much. As it turned out, Blaylock had three previous convictions for sexual assault, kidnapping, and child molestation. Just four years earlier, in 1995, he completed a sentence of nearly six years on charges stemming from false imprisonment and failure to register as a sex offender. At the time, Arizona law did not require that information to be made publicly available to his neighbors prior to his moving in. According to early reports, Blaylock was thoroughly questioned by investigators. He acknowledged that he knew of McKell. She had taken piano lessons directly across the street from his house, but he alleged to have never approached or had a conversation with the child. As for his whereabouts on the day in question, Blaylock had an alibi supported by his wife. According to them, he couldn't have been involved in the abduction as he was home at the time it occurred, working on the lawnmower in the garage while watching an Arizona Cardinals game. At the time, Blaylock was cooperative to a degree, allowing investigators to search his home. However, there was a trailer on the Blaylock property which investigators didn't have a right to search without a warrant. When police later returned to serve that warrant, the trailer had mysteriously vanished, leading many, including the Biggs family themselves, to wonder whether or not McKell had ever been inside that trailer, or perhaps might have been there the night police came knocking. Unfortunately, without further information, investigators didn't have enough evidence to take Blaylock in or force him to answer further questions. Finding the circumstances suspicious but with nothing to go on, police turned their attention elsewhere. As is often the case with missing children, investigators focused in closely on McKell's family, specifically her father who was not home at the time of the abduction. Two detectives were initially put in charge, Butch Gates and Jerry Gazelle, and they wanted to ask Darren further questions about the night his daughter vanished. According to Gates and Gazelle, while Darren had initially stated that he'd been at work at the time of the abduction, their investigation led them to see that he had actually not been at work and instead was at a friend's home. This lie caused them to focus in harder on Darren, much to the dismay of the family. None of them believed Darren could be responsible. He had a very good relationship with his daughter. He had no reason to abduct her. At the urging of the FBI, Darren agreed to submit to a polygraph test, but the results would only cause more issues for the grieving and frustrated father. The results of that test came back inconclusive, though this wasn't exactly a surprise to Darren or those who had administered the test. His emotional state at the time was disrupted, and when later asked about the results, Darren explained, quote, That doesn't surprise me. I figured it would be because they said I was too angry. End quote. Even police agreed that his emotional state at the time was unlikely to return a positive or negative result. Regardless, police continued following this line of suspicion, and ultimately, the Biggs family was put through hell over it. As you might imagine, the family felt that police were wasting important time and resources pursuing Darren for no reason. The evidence of the scene seemed to contradict his involvement. Police later said, based on the quarters on the ground and the bike found where it was, they believed McKell had attempted to evade her abductor. As Gazelle later told the Arizona Republic, quote, She was running from somebody based on the evidence we do have. It wasn't somebody that she knew or wanted to be with. She dropped the bike. She was running towards home. She dropped the quarters, and it was swift. And somebody grabbed her and I believe abducted her in a car and drove away with her, end quote. When speaking on the Vanished podcast, Kimber went into some detail about the impact this had, telling Marissa, quote, It's hard not to hold resentment in that situation. I think it was a waste of time, a waste of resources. He was constantly battered, lie detector tests and everything, and he was under so much stress, and he was miserable and terrified. His daughter was missing, and I know a lot of young children, when they go missing, the parents are generally the first ones that are looked at. I know that's very common, but I feel like they took it too far. I feel like there was far too much focus on it, and it could have had time and resources better spent. End quote. Ultimately, 
Police would spend a year tailing Darren and using surveillance to keep track of him. At no point was he uncooperative with the investigation. At no point did he do anything which further aroused investigators' suspicions. In fact, after spending so long trying to determine whether or not Darren was involved, police went over the timeline again and again, and it was determined that the window of opportunity he had was far too small to have abducted Mikkel. He couldn't have left his friend's home, grabbed Mikkel, stashed her somewhere, and then made it home when he did. It was physically impossible. While police put the Biggs' family, and specifically Darren, through hell, he was ultimately exonerated of any possible involvement. Even after all they had put him through, Darren still spoke positively of the police, telling the Republic, quote, It's a real comfort to us to know that the Mesa Police Department will not slow down. End quote. Despite his exoneration, to this day, people hurl insults and attacks at him and the family for defending him. While police have moved on, having cleared Darren and believing that he was in no way involved, others continue to push the theory despite an absence of any actual evidence. This continues to be a difficult aspect of an already overwhelmingly miserable situation for the family. Kimber, who years later created a Facebook page, Justice for Mikkel Biggs, continues to fight against trolls who come onto the page with the full intention of accusing Darren of being involved and the family of covering it up. It truly just adds more pain to an already tragic situation for a family which has suffered so greatly. The fact of the matter is, no investigators believe Darren was involved, but that has had little impact in terms of mitigating those who would accuse him. While Darren was being looked at, Investigators turned to other options as well. In total, more than 500 tips from so-called psychics were consulted and analyzed, but each led in different directions, sometimes to different states, where investigators would go to track down leads which were either found to be mistaken or outright hoaxes. Investigators and searchers spread out far and wide, going through abandoned mine shafts, crawling over the large expanse of arid desert, combing the streets of Mesa, but nothing could be found which led them even one step closer to locating Mikkel. Mesa Police Detective Steve Berry later told CBS News, quote, We don't have any solid evidence that ties anyone to Mikkel's disappearance. Any type of closure we can provide, that is our job. There's always a glimmer of hope. We are never going to give up. End quote. During the course of their investigation, police considered the possibility that Mikkel's disappearance might be related to an attack which had taken place just a week prior on Christmas. An 11-year-old girl less than a mile from where Mikkel was last seen was lured behind an apartment complex by an older man who attempted to sexually assault her. While the child managed to escape, police released a composite sketch of the suspect. They weren't sure at the time if there were any connections, though Detective Jose Martinez said there was a possibility and therefore they had to pursue it. Based on descriptions given by both the victim and witnesses who had seen the man, authorities believed they were looking for a transient. One detail, though, which cast doubt on there being a connection, seemed to be that the man was riding around on a bike, not driving around in a car, and investigators firmly believed that Mikkel had been taken by someone in a car or truck. Throughout this time, the Biggs family worked hard to keep Mikkel's name in the headlines, and she actually received a lot of coverage. Several national news shows aired segments discussing her case. Newspapers ran stories almost daily for the first few weeks. The Phoenix Suns basketball team donated money for the production of more flyers, while the Arizona Coyotes hockey team broadcast Mikkel's photo on their scoreboard during games. On January 13th, 11 days after Mikkel was taken, police announced a $31,000 reward was available for information which led to Mikkel. By this time, police had received more than 4,000 tips in the case, and tracking them down was taking valuable time. Sadly, though, none of those tips panned out, and the case began growing cold. It would take eight months before police would get what they considered a possible break in the case leading them back to someone they had spoken to very early on in the investigation following a horrifying attack 
not far from where Mikkel had vanished. A woman who lived a few blocks from the Biggs's home came home on Monday, September 27th, and was the victim of a violent and brutal attack. Upon entering her home, a man came out from his hiding space behind her refrigerator. His pants were unzipped, and he exposed himself to the woman before he struck, grabbing her in a tight headlock which resulted in a broken neck. The attacker sexually assaulted the woman before viciously beating her unconscious. Following this attack, the man set the home ablaze, leaving his unconscious victim on the floor to be killed in the fire. Luckily for her, she regained consciousness and was able to call for assistance before the fire could consume her and her home. The victim was able to identify her attacker, D. Blaylock, the man who owned the trailer police had wanted to search. In a strange turn of events, as the victim was being rushed to the hospital, she told EMTs that she believed this man had also been responsible for Mikkel Biggs' disappearance. When Blaylock was questioned, he alleged that he couldn't have been the attacker since he had left his home to go to a nearby convenience store on a beer run. However, investigators discovered both Blaylock's DNA on the victim as well as the victim's DNA in a pair of Blaylock's underwear. Ultimately, he was arrested and charged. When the case went to trial, it took a jury just over an hour to convict Blaylock of the violent and vicious assault for which he received a sentence of 187 years in prison. It was following Blaylock's arrest that police once again spoke to his wife, who had supported his alibi about the night Mikkel had been abducted. This time, though, she had a different story to tell. According to People magazine, Blaylock's wife told investigators that he was extremely controlling and she did as he ordered her to do. In terms of the night Mikkel disappeared, she told investigators her support of his alibi wasn't 100% true. That night, she explained, Blaylock had requested that she make him some sandwiches and deliver them to him in the garage. Following the delivery of the food, he apparently told his wife to stay away from him and the garage that night. She couldn't say where he was, whether he remained in the garage or if he had left the home. She had absolutely no idea. I think it's important to note that the woman Blaylock assaulted lived just a few houses away from him, and Mikkel disappeared off the same road that Blaylock lived on. Wanting to confront Blaylock themselves, the Biggses decided to approach him through a letter. In the letter, Blaylock was asked if he was involved in Mikkel's disappearance. Darren later explained to ABC News, quote, I told him, if I'm wrong, I won't be able to do enough to apologize to you, because that's a terrible thing to be accused of, but I don't care if I have to accuse a million different people until I find the right one, end quote. Much to their surprise, Blaylock actually responded, sending a letter back. In the letter, he wrote in part, quote, I need to make things right with you and your family, end quote. He invited Darren and Tracy to visit him in prison to discuss things. While it seemed possible that Blaylock was going to admit his guilt and maybe reveal the location of Mikkel's remains, as her family had since come to believe that she had likely been killed, Blaylock had something else in mind. As Darren later explained, quote, he just denied, 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 denied. He got mad a couple of times, but he never walked away, end quote. While Darren and Tracy walked out of that meeting believing it was likely that Blaylock was responsible for Mikkel's disappearance, they simply couldn't be 100% sure. They felt it. They felt that they were sitting across from the man who had taken their daughter from them, but they also felt there was just enough doubt left for them to be unable to say it for certain. It was quite similar to how police felt. Off the record, Many investigators who had worked the case believed Blaylock was responsible, but they didn't have enough evidence to say anything officially on the record. With an inability to pin anything directly to Blaylock, police had little else they could do but pursue other leads. They tracked down and spoke with every ice cream truck operating in the area. Searches were conducted on their vehicles, but none of the drivers ever entered McKell's neighborhood the night she vanished. No witnesses reported seeing the ice cream truck in the neighborhood either, which was reportedly a few blocks away. The possibility, though, remained that while Blaylock seemed like the likely culprit, there was a slim chance this could have been a crime committed by someone else. 
and so the investigation continued, though it would grow colder. Six years after her disappearance, McKell's family held a funeral with an empty coffin. They were desperate for some sense of catharsis, and it was believed that this might help them cope with the likelihood that McKell was gone and wouldn't be coming back, but it did little to assuage their pain. They now had a place to visit, to speak to McKell, and over the years they've gone back time and again, but it didn't make anything easier, nor did it bring the closure they had hoped for. At the time, the family was harshly criticized for this move. People felt they were essentially giving up on Mikkel, but the family argued that wasn't the case. They just needed to do something to confront the unknown, to give themselves a chance to accept the horror of what had happened. Soon, time began passing more rapidly. Years moved by with little or no developments at all. Difficult as it was, the Biggs family worked hard to move on with their lives, but they never let go of Mikkel nor their hope that someday her case would be solved. More than 18 years passed before investigators received any news about this case, and when they did, it was a divisive discovery which, for the most part, neither police nor the family believe is actually real. More than 1,700 miles away, in a small Wisconsin town, a dollar bill was found with a haunting message scrolled along the edge. The message read in total, quote, my name is Mikkel Biggs, kidnapped from Mesa, Arizona. I'm alive. End quote. There was a problem with this, though. Mikkel's name was spelled wrong. The handwriting didn't match the known handwriting of Mikkel, and her family has stated that they believe it's a hoax. Some, though, think there's a possibility that the note could have been written by someone with knowledge of the case. Chief Kevin Wilkinson, who works for the police department in Wisconsin, later told ABC News, quote, Why would you pick that one, a case that's nearly 20 years old? It's somebody who knew something about that case, end quote. Unfortunately, tracking the bill was nearly impossible. It was printed in 2009, a decade after Mikkel had disappeared and nearly a decade before it was found, and it had likely passed through thousands of people's hands over the years. Whether or not the dollar bill was a legitimate clue remains unknown. It's been nearly 22 years since 11-year-old Mikkel Biggs vanished from the streets she grew up on. In all of that time, few, if any, developments have happened. While tips had flooded in during the early years, they've slowed down to a trickle, though investigators fully believe there is someone out there that has knowledge of the case and could provide them with the answers they have been seeking. The bike that Mikkel was riding still sits in an evidence room with the Mesa Police Department, bagged and protected. Detective Dominic Kaufman later spoke to ABC News about the bike, saying, quote, It's been checked for fingerprints and DNA, and obviously, we still keep it packaged after the initial processing, just in case there's some new technology that comes about that we don't know about. End quote. While the details have never been revealed, it has been reported that police gathered several pieces of evidence in connection to Mikkel's disappearance, though more than two decades later, nothing has yielded results. Over the years, Kimber has become a major advocate for her sister, giving interviews and becoming involved with organizations in hopes of drawing attention to the case. It's exceedingly important to keep Mikkel's name in the public because you just never know what detail might spark a memory or convince someone to tell you what they know. A mother herself now, Kimber can't help but be impacted by the abduction of her sister when it comes to raising her own children. That fear is there, and the possibilities of what could happen are far too real to ignore. Through her Facebook page, Justice for Mikkel Biggs, Kimber continues to work hard and dedicates herself to finding her sister and hopefully, someday, getting an answer. For their part, Investigators do believe they will eventually crack this case, with Detective Kaufman explaining, quote, Maybe not today, maybe not in a year, but we will solve this case. End quote. When last seen, Mikkel Diane Biggs was described as being an 11 year old Caucasian female with blonde hair and hazel eyes, standing 4 feet 8 inches tall and weighing 85 pounds. Mikkel was last seen wearing a red t-shirt with her elementary school, Lindbergh, printed on the front, 
and bell-bottom jeans embroidered with seams on both sides of the legs, as well as white canvas shoes. Mikkel has prominent upper front teeth, pierced ears, and several moles on the left side of her neck. Prior to her disappearance, her hair had been permed and was in the process of growing out. She may have been wearing earrings and possibly a purple Barbie watch at the time. She was last seen near the intersection of El Moro and Toltec streets in Mesa, Arizona. Obviously, as more than 20 years have passed, age-progressed photographs are available. It's been far too long for a family to endure the unknown, to miss their daughter, their sister, to not know the truth of what happened or have the ability to give her a proper burial, if indeed she is deceased. Despite their pain and grief, neither the family nor investigators have ever given up their hope of someday finding the answers. The belief remains that someone out there knows what happened to Mikkel, and it's the family's hope that they will come forward and share what they know. Speaking with CBS News, Kimber explained, quote, It's bittersweet. I want to be around my family and celebrate and remember her, but it's really hard to bear sometimes. My dad has said it before, that a secret doesn't stay a secret. Someone knows something. It's just a matter of getting that someone to say something. I can't tell you how many times in my childhood I stood alone on the curb waiting for the ice cream man. It never came with a sense of fear or dread. Sometimes it was the most exciting thing to happen all day. I imagine it was similar for Mikkel Biggs, riding her sister's bike and just waiting to see the truck round the corner heading her way, two quarters clutched tightly in her hand. Somehow, though, in a span of less than two minutes, someone else came driving down that street and Mikkel was taken. Now, more than 20 years later, the truth of what happened to the 11-year-old remains hidden, the answers to this mystery stubbornly avoiding the light for all of this time. After countless hours of searches and investigation, police have never been able to share much about what they believe happened that day. Evidence at the scene suggests that Mikkel knew something was wrong, that she tried to get away, but her abductor managed to grab her and vanish in the blink of an eye. Child abductions are always horrifying and disturbing, but there's an extra layer of horror mixed in when you consider that Mikkel Biggs was taken just a short distance from her home, a home which evidence suggests she tried to run to, but just couldn't make it. I can't begin to imagine how terrifying that must have been, nor can I claim to understand the full level of grief and sorrow her family must feel to this day. They've grown up. Mikkel's siblings have gone forward with their lives and in some cases had children of their own, children whose faces likely show shades of Mikkel. She never got to live her life, to pursue her dream of being an animator, to graduate high school, fall in love, go off to college. She never got to see her 12th birthday. She was taken four months prior. All that was left behind was her sister's bike the tire still spinning and two quarters lying on the pavement where she either dropped them or they were forced from her hand. Considering the startling lack of evidence in this case, it's almost as if she disappeared from the face of the earth, but we know better, as does her family. Children don't just vanish. Someone took Mikkel, and for more than 20 years that someone has evaded paying the price for this atrocious crime. Looking at this case, there aren't a ton of theories out there. For the most part, it's divided fairly evenly into two. Either Mikkel was taken by someone who for all these years remained unidentified, or Mikkel's abductor is D. Blaylock, who's right where he belongs, serving time in prison for a separate and equally disturbing crime, which he may never have had the chance to conduct, if only the people in his neighborhood knew what a dangerous and violent criminal was living just a few doors away. So I think we'll begin with the first theory that maybe Mikkel was taken by someone else, and then we'll work our way towards discussing Blaylock himself. I think the first obstacle you face when examining this theory is the time frame. 90 seconds, or maybe a little less, is not a large amount of time to execute an abduction, and to do so on a neighborhood street before the sun is fully set is brazen, to say the least. Bloodhounds tracked Mikkel's scent from the location where she had left the bike to several feet away, where investigators believe she was likely pulled into a vehicle. Being that the abduction took place right around 6 p.m., 
and police were notified by 6.15, this doesn't leave the abductor a lot of time. There's a good chance that while police were flooding the area, he wasn't very far away, if he had even left the neighborhood. There's really only two ways this could have gone down. Either someone was actively in pursuit of Mikkel, and when she was alone, seized the opportunity, or it was a matter of terrible timing in that someone out looking for trouble just happened upon the 11-year-old in that small span of a minute and a half that she was alone. If someone was specifically targeting her, it's possible she was being watched, that this person was waiting for their moment to strike and it presented itself that night. If it was random and a matter of happenstance, then you're looking for an abductor who has little fear of being caught. Grabbing a child from a quiet suburban street on a January evening is not exactly the type of thing you'd imagine someone specifically planning to do. It just seems too risky, but then again, there's a lot of sick people out there who simply don't weigh the odds, and once they've decided they're going to do something, nothing is going to stop them. Now, we know from the attempted assault that took place a week or so prior to Mikkel's disappearance that there were certainly people in the area who were targeting children. Unfortunately, that's likely true regardless of what city you happen to live in. I suppose when it comes to Mikkel, though, we have to try and determine how likely it is that someone looking to abduct a child just happened to drive down that street at that time and found her. The odds are generally stacked against it, but that doesn't make it impossible. This is an angle of the case that I see debated a lot. Could a totally unknown suspect have pulled this off? The truth is, while it seems incredibly unlikely, you can't really rule it out. There's been all sorts of theories revolving around this. Maybe it was someone passing through the neighborhood and saw an opportunity. Maybe it was someone who was familiar with the location, knew children lived in that area, and they didn't particularly care who they grabbed as long as they grabbed someone. I've even read a few theories where people have speculated that an abductor could have been playing the melody of an ice cream man specifically to lure children outside, at which time they could strike, but they'd really have no way of knowing that they'd be able to find a child standing by herself. Not to mention, no one in the neighborhood reported hearing the music approaching, which seems to suggest that if someone was playing that music, they had turned it off by the time they drove down the quiet street. I mean, that music is going to draw attention, and that's probably not what the person wants to do if they're looking to abduct a child. There's a lot of different possibilities here. We know there were at least 20 registered sex offenders living in the area that police questioned in regard to this case. While 19 of them have never been named, there is a possibility that one of them could have been responsible. We know in the hours after the abduction, police and volunteers went door to door, often entering homes and searching for Mikkel. But considering how fast the crime occurred, some have theorized that a neighbor might have been involved and perhaps not the neighbor that everyone suspects. In a lot of cases, volunteers were invited into homes to look around, but if you're in the business of abducting a child, there's a good chance there's some kind of a hidden area or space to conceal a child that a volunteer might not look for. There's also the possibility that the abductor could have simply left the area, putting Mikkel somewhere else, before returning home and maybe even joining in on those searches. The fact is, there's far too many possibilities here. We can't analyze every potential angle because they're almost infinite. A transient, someone who passed through the neighborhood, someone who had never been there before, someone who knew Mikkel and had been stalking her, or someone who was planning to abduct her. You can't rule out any possibilities in this case, and that makes it all the more frustrating. Police believe Mikkel ran from her abductor, which suggests only a handful of possibilities. Either she didn't know this person and was scared, or she did know this person and had a reason to be scared. The truth is, unless more information is released, witnesses have something more to add or something new is found, a total stranger abduction remains possible. For many, though, they believe they know exactly who took Mikkel, the man living just down the road with a criminal history of targeting both children and adults, D. Blaylock. Looking through Blaylock's arrest history is disturbing, to say the least. You find arrests for unlawful imprisonment, failure to register as a sex offender, burglary in the second degree, kidnapping, sexual abuse, sexual assault, and aggravated assault. Charges go back as far as 1989, 
and the smart money would suggest he likely got away with several crimes before he was ever caught, and possibly got away with other crimes in between the ones for which he was later caught. Since being in prison this last time in 2001, he has had two official disciplinary infractions listed. One in 2001 for possessing and manufacturing a weapon, and another for fighting. Even in prison, they don't look kindly on pedophiles, so I'd imagine he's been on the receiving end of quite a few violent assaults during his imprisonment, and I can't tell you just how much my heart bleeds for him. I do take some solace in seeing his sentence officially doesn't end until the year 2202, but I digress. In the crimes he committed prior to McKell's disappearance, Blaylock didn't behave violently, for lack of a better term. He abducted people, sexually assaulted them, molested children, but he never beat anyone or attempted to murder them. If indeed Blaylock is responsible for McKell's disappearance, then this would mark a watershed moment in his criminal acts, being the first time that one of his victims disappeared and was never found. Now, some have argued that maybe he had been violent in the past but got away with it, while others believe that something was different here, whether it was all part of his plan or if something went wrong, no one can really say. All we do know is that if Blaylock took Mikkel, he likely took her life as well. Seven months later, he brutally attacks a neighbor. According to her testimony, he tried to break her neck several times before succeeding. He sexually assaulted her, then beat her incredibly brutally before setting her home on fire and leaving her to die in the blaze. Luckily, she came to before it was too late and managed to escape with her life and the ability to point the finger at Blaylock. You have to wonder, though, why after so many crimes did he finally decide to go for murder? One could argue something may have happened with Mikkel. Maybe he didn't intend to kill her, but something went wrong, or he took things too far when it was all said and done, and maybe he liked that feeling. Maybe it satisfied something in him for the time, and then less than a year later, he wanted to feel it again. I think it's important to note, though, that Blaylock didn't choose his neighbor victim at random. In the days before the attack, he had approached this neighbor and made unwanted advances. She later said, quote, He was coming up on me. He was drunk. He reeked of beer. He was putting his hands on me in my yard. I called the police. I said, This guy's just creeping me out. He's stalking me. I tried to tell his wife. End quote. But police never followed up on that complaint and the victim never knew that Blaylock wasn't just a creepy drunk, but a man who had been charged with sex crimes in three separate states. Maybe it was the brutal nature of the crime, maybe it was the sexual aspect of it, but for whatever reason, the victim firmly believed that Blaylock had also been responsible for Mikkel's disappearance. She later told this to police as well as Mikkel's family. The victim was so certain that Blaylock was responsible she offered to drop all charges against him if only he would confess and tell Mikkel's family what had happened and where she was. Police, though, explained to the victim that they couldn't drop their charges and Blaylock would have to go to trial. Now, investigators were able to get confirmation from Blaylock that he had seen Mikkel before. He confirmed that he had witnessed her going to piano lessons directly across the street from his own home. This has led many to wonder whether or not Blaylock began obsessing with her at that time and maybe planned an abduction, or if it simply implanted Mikkel in his mind, and on that cold January evening, he saw an opportunity and seized it. There's never been much presented to suggest that Blaylock stalked or followed Mikkel, but it isn't difficult to imagine that it might have been a crime of horrible and terrifying coincidence. Maybe Blaylock did leave his home that night to get beer, and saw the opportunity of Mikkel outside by herself. Or maybe he had left knowing he was going to do something terrible, but he didn't know who he was going to do it to until he saw Mikkel. There's no solid evidence to link Blaylock to the crime, but there's a lot of coincidence and circumstantial evidence which makes him a likely suspect for most people who examine this case. Firstly, based on the attack for which he's in prison, it's safe to say he didn't have a problem targeting victims who lived very close to him. Most of the time, killers don't go after neighbors, although in some cases they do. That certainly happened with BTK. But this is also a man who had a major drinking problem and maybe didn't think very far ahead or became much more impulsive as he drank. 
Maybe alcohol just added to the embers of violence burning in him and helped that fire grow out of control until he lashed out. Or maybe he just liked to get drunk and do horrible things. Either way, now you've got a guy with a history of sexual assaults and abductions living approximately a quarter mile from Mikkel who had seen her in the past and was apparently aware that she lived nearby. We know from his last attack that killing and brutal violence wasn't outside of his realm of possibilities, so you've got to consider if he was willing to kill a neighbor seven months later, there's a good chance he was willing to take Mikkel's life as well. Maybe he decided after serving time in prison that, if he was going to continue his crimes, he couldn't leave any witnesses behind anymore. While there's no physical evidence to link Blaylock to Mikkel, there is the matter of the trailer. From everything I've gathered, when police arrived at the Blaylock home that night, they were able to search the home, but the trailer which was on the property required a search warrant. By the time investigators returned with a warrant, the trailer was gone, and there doesn't appear to be anything saying where it went or ultimately what happened to it. In the years since, many people including Mikkel's family have speculated that it's possible Mikkel could have been in the trailer that night when police were there. Whether or not she was, we can't know, but the fact is it was gone before they could come back, and that tells me there was something in there that Blaylock did not want them to find. At the time, police had nothing to go on because Blaylock's alibi, that he was in the garage watching baseball, was corroborated by his wife. It wasn't until after his later arrest that she recanted that alibi and explained her living situation. According to her, Blaylock was a domineering and controlling man who she feared, and when he told her to do something, she did it. We know now that the night Mikkel disappeared, Blaylock has no alibi. That doesn't necessarily make him guilty, but it does open the door to some interesting possibilities. Beyond that, Blaylock involved himself in the case to some degree. According to Kimber, Blaylock attended at least one candlelight vigil that was held for Mikkel. It isn't entirely uncommon for these types to attend vigils or even participate in searches. They want to be close to the crime. They want to be able to relive it. That's some kind of sick satisfaction in witnessing the horrors they have created, and maybe to a degree, they want a little insight into how the investigation is going, whether or not they're in the clear. Or maybe they just want to seem like concerned citizens so they're not looked at as suspects. But Blaylock's odd behavior doesn't stop there. While in prison, he wrote to Mikkel's family and suggested that he needed to make things right with them. But when they visited, he denied any knowledge of what happened to Mikkel. Was he telling the truth, or was this the only way he had left to wield control and power? That's something we may never know the answer to. But we do know that when Darren and Tracy walked out of their meeting with him, they felt very strongly they had just spoken to the man who had abducted and killed their daughter. So you've got a violent sexual predator living a quarter mile from the spot where Mikkel disappeared. He knows Mikkel in as much as he has seen her in the past. Whether or not he's ever approached her or tried to speak with her, we don't know. He has a trailer he won't give investigators access to, which he then gets rid of before they can force him to. He later attacks a woman not far from where Mikkel was taken and ultimately is sentenced to 187 years in prison. He never tried to kill anyone before. But after Mikkel's disappearance, something changes. He becomes violent. He tries to kill his next victim. I suppose the question remains, did he target Mikkel with the intent of murder, or did something happen along the way which pushed him over that edge, or was he just really drunk? We know he approached his neighbor and attempted to assault her before he broke into her home, but from what we've gathered, he never approached Mikkel. Is it possible that it was really just a matter of timing? There doesn't appear to be any evidence that Blaylock stalked Mikkel. No one saw him in the area that night, so he could have left his home that night and just saw the opportunity and taken it, right? Frankly, I think there's a very good chance that's what happened. Maybe it wasn't planned. Maybe it was just spur of the moment. He saw her and decided to act. And somehow in less than 90 seconds, he managed to abduct Mikkel and commit a crime which continues to radiate more than 20 years later. So what do you think happened here? Did D. Blaylock abduct and likely murder Mikkel Biggs? Or is it possible that this crime was committed by someone who has managed to elude authorities for more than two decades? 
It's difficult for me to consider anyone other than Blaylock. He had the means, motive, and opportunity. It fits with his history, and there's no doubt that following Mikkel's disappearance, he commits his first confirmed crime in which he violently beats and attempts to murder his victim. What are the chances that all of that is just coincidence, that it's not connected? Looking at crimes like this, you begin to believe that coincidences just don't happen. There's always something behind them, and to me, it's almost impossible to see the other options. Unfortunately, due to a lack of evidence, no one can say for sure. All we can hope is that with some time, something will be revealed. Blaylock was a fall-down drunk. What are the chances that he didn't tell someone about this crime, either in the months after or the years since he's been in prison? Sadly, unless one of those people he told comes forward, new information is found or Blaylock himself decides to confess. The abduction of Mikkel Biggs will remain open, unsolved, and very cold. If you're looking for more information about the vanishing of Mikkel Biggs, several podcasts have covered this case, including The Vanished and Criminology. There have been several major news programs on it, and there are a lot of newspaper articles discussing this case. You can also visit Kimber's Facebook page by searching for Justice for Mikkel Biggs. If you have any information about the abduction of Mikkel Biggs, please contact the Mesa Police Department at 480-644-2211. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, message me on Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or comment in the Facebook group. I'd like to take a moment now to thank our amazing Patreon producers, Alicia Lorraine, Aurora Kay, Brittany Bivens, Brian Kemmerling, Christine Greco, Krista Colvin, Dearthy, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Guillerme Pinto, James, Jason Yeager, Jennifer Winkler, Joanne Berkwitz, Kate Much, Megan Cotter, Michael Graves, Nick Mohar Schurz, Pamela Coburn, Quinn McBreen, Roberta Jansen, Sarah, Sarah Muscaratolo, Tara Doble, Travis Skepko, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Tom Archer, and Tracy Woods. You're all amazing and your contributions are greatly appreciated, as are all patrons. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence or visit trace-evidence.com for further information. I want to thank you all for taking the time to listen, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.